Please be seated. Amen. So good to see y'all here this morning. Welcome to McQueenie Baptist Church. Uh, man, it's beautiful outside, isn't it? It's great to get up and feel cool and come to church. Uh, so I'm glad to be here. I'm glad you're here as well. Just a few announcements we want to mention this morning. First of all, on the, the truck or treat is coming up on October the 31st. Uh, I think in the bulletin on the back it says 6.30 to 7.30. That, we need to change that to, from 6 o'clock to 7 because we want to we do this before it gets really dark, okay? Uh, so 6 to 7 on the 31st. Right now there's two things we're needing. We're needing candy donations. So if you bring some candy so that we can have plenty of candy for the kids on that night, uh, there's a box in the foyer out this direction. If you'll just come and drop it there, that would be very helpful. The second thing is we're asking the people to help by decorating your car trunk. And the way this works, you just pull into a parking space, you decorate, open your trunk or the back of your SUV or whatever, and then you decorate it and do some maybe some kind of little game or something for the kids. They'll come around and, and walk by your trunk and you'll get a chance to uh, treat the kids. And so if you'd be willing to do that, sign up on the information table at the back of the church. Just let us know that you'd be willing to help out with that and be a part of that, and it would be great. Second thing is today we start our young adult ministry, and um, the young adult ministry will be for anybody that's kind of out of high school, out of school, maybe college age and, and young adults. Everybody that's uh, in that age group is invited. It's this evening at uh, 6 o'clock from 6 to 7.30. It'll be in the uh, student center, which is the last building out this direction. So if you know somebody in that age range, invite them to come. If you know somebody maybe that used to come to McQueenie and maybe grew up here and maybe they've been disconnected, encourage them to come to the young adult uh, uh, ministry this evening. And then finally, we're going to start Christmas, Operation Christmas Child. How many of you know what that is? Raise your hands. Okay, just about everybody here knows that uh, we decorate a shoebox uh, and send it to a child somewhere in this world that will not receive a Christmas gift. And we're going to start that next Sunday. Next Sunday, Actually, you can start any time you want. If you want to go and pick up a shoebox and go ahead and begin uh, uh, shopping for that child, uh, although you don't really know. Yeah, we won't know. I'm sorry. You won't know until you pick up the uh, names of the child, whether it's a girl or boy, if you're going to be decorating a box and setting it up for a child that's female or male. So that will start next Sunday. And we will have boxes here available. You can pick one up or you can pick up your own. The one thing that we're doing differently last year and this year is that we, we in the past, we had a packing party where we would buy all this stuff and have it here and you would come in and walk through and pack the box. Uh, we're asking that everybody that takes a box or several boxes will simply take those uh, for a boy or girl and go and shop for that child pack the box and get it ready. We're not going to do the packing party. This will be something that you can do with your child or your grandchild and uh, encourage them to, as a way to help them uh, give of themselves, okay, and be a part of giving. And so that's going to start next Sunday. Hope you'll be in prayer about that and be a, a participant in that. So this morning, it's good to have you here. It's great to be in God's house and to be alive and breathing and with the opportunity to worship together. So I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to do one more thing before we begin to sing together again. We're going to pray. Let's do that right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beautiful day that you've given us. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come into your house this morning and to worship you, you. in spirit and in truth. And Lord, we pray today that the, the things that we sing, the words that we sing, would not just be words from our lips, but yeah. truly would be the, the, uh, the, something that comes from our innermost being, from our heart. And we pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship together. There is a name.
When my life work is ended and I cross the swelling tide, when the bright and glorious morning I shall see, I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side, and His smile will be the first to welcome me. I shall know Him, I shall know Him, and redeemed by When I view his blessed face And the luster of his kindly beaming eye How my full heart will praise him For his mercy, love, and grace That prepare for me a mansion in the sky I shall know him, I shall know him And redeemed by his side I shall stand I shall know him, I shall know him By the print of the nails in his hands Through the gates of the city in a robe of spotless white He will lead me where no tears will ever fall In the glad song of ages I shall mingle with delight But I long to meet my Savior first of I shall know him, I shall know him, and redeemed by his side I shall stand. I shall know him, I shall know him, by the bread of the nails in his hands. Whoa.
sing that chorus first and then have you sing it with us. But I was preparing for this song. I couldn't help but think about what's ahead of us. No more burdens. No more pain. No more sickness. No more death. Have you ever really thought about what that's going to be when we glide through the gates of heaven and see our Jesus fall on our knees and worship him in all his glory, his splendor, and his grace. Sing that for us with us. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. Upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by my hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. What a day. Glorious 
Amen. John, thank you for a beautiful song this morning. And, um, you know, I guess uh, when you lose people that you really care about, uh, it, it's always good to go back in your heart and mind to those basic truths that we have, that this is not all there is. You know, we lost Claudia Wallace this last week, and uh, I know many are grieving that loss. But uh, we always stand in the, in the truth of the promise of eternal life, don't we? This is, this is not all that there is. So we've been talking in the last few weeks about truth. I mean, just kind of pulling apart what it means in the world that we're living in today. You know, how is truth being held up? How is truth being attacked? How is it being pulled apart? We talked about several things. We talked about the post-truth culture, which is basically to say that, that uh, there, is, uh, there is some absolute truths, but those absolute truths are always to be subjugated to our personal preferences. In other words, I know the Bible says this, but it doesn't really work for me in my life. Uh, that's kind of a post-truth way of thinking. Uh, also, it has to do with the idea of how we promote our own agendas. So, I know that this is what the Bible says. I know this is what we used to believe to be true, but even though that is some, there's some truth in that, this truth is to be kind of put backwards or behind my own personal agenda or the agenda that I'm putting forth in culture and in society today. So we talked about that whole concept of post-truth. And then last week we talked about standpoint epistemology, talking about how um, our, our way to knowledge, how we gain knowledge has to do with our standpoint or how we perceive things in life. It's based upon coming out of culture rather than coming out of the Word of God. Today, we want to talk about something I think is uh, tremendously important. So, let's, we're going to roll this little clip. Go ahead. Got very good arms. He didn't fall? Inconceivable. You keep using the horn. I don't think it means what you think it means. <laughs> You keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. So all through this movie, I don't know if you're familiar with The Princess Bride or not, but all through this movie, the, the, the villain continues to always say, inconceivable. He uses that word constantly. And finally, he, he gets kind of brought to task on that, doesn't he? I don't think it means what you think it means. Isn't that true in the world today? I mean, there's so many words that we use today that I'm not sure that they really mean what people think they mean. Um, I think about words like marriage. I think about words like, uh, like truth. I think about words like peace, love. All of these words are words that we know have a certain meaning to them, but in the culture that we're living in today, I'm not so sure that that's true. Words have meaning and words matter, don't they? I mean, isn't, aren't words the way that we use, the method we use, the only way that we have of communicating ideas? And so words really do matter. And so I want to start this morning by just pointing out uh, the reason that words matter. And, and we're going to look at this by looking at God's word. God uses the word to create. And that's in the very beginning, wasn't it? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We know that God created by his word. And, the, and it says, uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and God said, let there be light. And what happened? 
there was light. By the power of his word, God created all that we see around us, including us. And so the very act of God of creation is done through his spoken word. The second thing is this. Christ has been revealed as what? The word. Love John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It says this. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son of the father, full of grace and truth. The words we use matter tremendously. In fact, we, we look to the word of God to tell us the significance of words. And surely that is true. In fact, a basic principle of biblical interpretation, the, the official word for that is hermeneutics. Not that that's, you know, I've mentioned that word before and somebody says, Herman who? No, no, hermeneutics is the study of God's word. It's how we interpret God's word. And the biblical text, the words in the text cannot mean something that the spirit of God never intended them to mean. What does that mean? That means that we have to look into the word of God and we not only see the words that are written, we not only read the words that are written, but we have to ask the question, what do these words mean? And what do they mean by the Spirit of God that gave them to us? And one of the things we have to do in order to do that is we have to study what, what theologians and biblical scholars and most pastors understand is our biblical hermeneutics. We have to study the meanings of the words. And we have to do that by going back in time, looking at the context in which those words were used. Looking at the original meaning and how those meanings may have changed over the years so that we can understand what did God really intend for us to get by what he was saying and what he was having written down in his word. That's the importance of words. And yet today we're seeing in our culture, we've been talking about some of the things that are present and have changed in the culture that we're living in. And today we have a, a, a situation which is called linguistic theft. There in your outline, linguistic theft. What are we talking about? Well, this, talk, this is referring to the idea that somebody can take a word, kind of reshape that word. It still may be true, but it's only true-ish. And if something is not totally true, then that's the problem, isn't it? If, if we don't understand the word and what it means, and what happens is people are taking words and they're reshaping those words and applying them and using them in their own agenda so that when they, they use that word in their agenda, they can use that word then on their agenda to promote what they want people to accept. And we're seeing that everywhere around us today. In fact, uh, many of the words that we take for granted today are being, are being re, uh, redefined and used in, in different ways. Now, let me just mention, we're not talking about you know, words do change over time. Have you noticed that? I mean, I, I did some looking at some words that used to mean one thing, and today they mean something totally different, right? I mean, uh, we even have uh, the word uh, gay in one of our, uh, in, a, in a seasonal song that we sing, right? Yeah, let us don, we now our gay apparel. Well, I don't think I'm going to do that <laughs> because it doesn't mean now what it meant then, Okay. And so, I'm just saying that words have a natural tendency to change over time, but we're not talking about that. That's something that happens naturally over time. But what we are talking about is something that is intentional and purposeful. It is something that is done with forethought and with intent. And that is to take a word and reshape its meaning. Linguistic theft. There are three steps to it. This isn't in your outline. I'm just going to quickly mention these. Uh, step one is to identify a core value that everybody accepts. For instance, let me take the word choice. We all agree that God created us and gave us the ability to choose, didn't he? That's called free will. In fact, we know that a relationship to God and through Jesus Christ can only be real when it's by our own choice. You can't force somebody to love someone else. It has to be a choice. If there's no freedom and there's no choice, then it's not real. So we take that word that most people universally agree, this concept of choice, 
And then that, that word is used to frame arguments that anyone has about a particular agenda that they have. Can anybody think of, a, of an agenda that is being used today in which the word choice is being used? Pro-choice. You think that's just a happenstance choice of words? No. Everybody, everybody agrees with the concept of choice. So when you frame the argument of, of abortion with pro-choice, what it's saying is now that if you don't agree with what we're doing, you're against choice. You're against freedom. That's how linguistic theft works. Taking a concept that everyone agrees with or perhaps one that everybody is against, the word hate. Does anybody in here think that it's appropriate and right to hate someone? No, we all agree that hate is wrong. But when you take that word hate and use that word to frame your argument so that if you stand against this, you're for hating someone else. And that, that is what is happening in our, in our world today. And so, linguistic theft, words like marriage, love, justice, hate, equality, tolerance, male, female, all words that seem to be, we have trouble defining today, or at least in our, in our understanding, because they're words that are being redefined in the world that we live in today. Now, I'm not going to talk any more about that except to say, I did include in your bulletin, there is a link that I printed there uh, to a very good uh, podcast. It's on YouTube, actually. You can go, and it's a, it's a great, I think it gives a lot of more insight about this concept of linguistic theft and how it's done and what are the words that are, have been actually, this has been done to in our, in our society today. And you can go and, and watch that if you want to or not. It's, it's up to you. But we need to understand that that is what is happening in our world today. Now, I want you to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3 and 4 with me for a moment. Anybody else in here in the last few days had a problem with allergies, coughing, sneezing? Yeah. One of the things it does to me is it makes my mouth dry. So anyway. Okay. 2 Corinthians 11 beginning in verse 3. I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Now, one of the things that I've kind of seen lately too is I actually believe that some of the terms that we hold very dear. In fact, some of the words in this very statement, let me mention a couple of them to you, um, that uh, where it talks about Christ. You know, in the world today, even the name of Jesus, the person of Christ, people are trying to redefine who he is and what he is. So that when you talk about Jesus and you talk about Christ, there's a whole different meaning that they're using in the world today than what we would mean in a Bible-believing church. Uh, so we talked about Jesus. Talks about a different spirit than the one you received, a different gospel. Some are even redefining what the word gospel means. We have a, a basic concept. The gospel is the truth, the message of Jesus Christ, him born to a virgin, uh, lived a sinless life, was crucified, buried, and raised again, and seated at the right hand of God the Father, coming back on the clouds of glory. We know, who, we know the gospel, but the world today is wanting to, seeking to redefine even what that means so that when you use the word gospel, it means something totally different. Now, we've seen this with other religions, by the way. Let me just caution you about that as well. There are some religions that will take the words that we, we uh, define in a certain way, like the word gospel or like son of God or like God, and they will take those terms and redefine them. They will use the same terminology so that if you say, do you believe that Jesus died for our sins? They will say, absolutely, we believe that Jesus died for your sins. But they don't mean the same thing that you mean by that. Okay, so we're gonna, we need to look at all of this idea of how truth and words are communicated because it's important. 
So let's ask this question. How did the serpent deceive Eve? We're told in this passage, aren't we? How the serpent deceived Eve. It was by his cunning, what? Deception. By his cunning deception. It says the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning. Do we understand that, that the power that's behind the redefinition of the words that we're talking about? And do we understand also that as believing Christians that we are living in a time where we are going to be increasingly looked upon with disdain because the, the world has redefined the terms that we hold dear, the things that we believe, so that we are being pushed and the ideas that we hold true are being seen as things that are in error or wrong. And so the, 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 we need to understand who is behind this change. Who is behind this deception that is taking place? It is none other than our enemy that has been around uh, ever since the beginning, and that is Satan himself. The enemy wants to deceive God's people. So what did the serpent say to Eve? What, what did he say to her? Well, Genesis 3.1, now the serpent was more crafty, more cunning than any other beast of the field than, than the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, this is what he said, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Did God really say that you shouldn't, could not eat of these things? Is that what he really said? What is, the, what is the devil doing there? He's questioning God's word, what God had truly and clearly said to Eve, and he's, he's putting just a little bit of doubt into what God had said and causing doubt in the mind of Eve so that she would then accept a lie and go the wrong direction. Did God actually say, is that what God meant? Okay, is that what God meant when he said, you cannot eat of any tree? What will this cunning deception, what will it do to us? Well, it tells us there in that 2 Corinthians passage, he says, I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Folks, that's why this is important. It's important that in the day that we live in that we not just accept everything at face value, that we look into it, that we, we examine it carefully. Because what the enemy is trying to do in the world that we live in today, what he's trying to do is lead us away from a pure and sincere devotion to Jesus Christ. And let me tell you something. There are many that are being led astray. There are many who are being led astray in the world in which we live today. So why do we, what do we, how do we respond to this? What's the proper response how do you respond to this deception of the enemy? Well, first of all, by something we can do. There's something we can just do. And that is, first of all, we can define and understand terms before we throw our hat in with a cause. Okay? It, we need to look at what's being said. When somebody says, uh, you know, we, we are standing for justice, we have a cause and we're standing for justice. How many of us would say, man, I don't want to be on the side of justice Anybody here say, I'm against justice? No. But what we do need to do is this. Ask, what do you mean when you use the word justice? Explain that to me. When somebody says we are against intolerance, what, are they, what do you mean by the word? When you use the word intolerance, what does that mean to you? Because tolerance today does not mean what it did even when I was a young man. It's changed and so we have to ask the question, especially I think of our young people that are being inundated. For one thing, they don't have sometimes the solid foundation of what we learned in the past. And so this is all new to them. And when somebody begins to define these terms and call them to a, a, a cause of justice and righteousness, they think they're moving in the right direction. They think they're moving in the direction that God would have them to go when in reality they are moving in exactly the opposite direction. So we have to ask the question, what do you mean by that? What is it that you mean? And then second is something that we not do. Okay, and the thing that we not do is not be ashamed of the truth. Now this is big 
Because we are living in a time when, let me tell you something, we are living in a time when to stand on the truth of God's word is going to put you in the path of those who say that they are standing up for justice and righteousness and truth. It will, it will put you in the path of those who are saying that they are standing for what is right and, they're, and that they're against those who are intolerant. That means that they will be against you because you are standing on what, on what the Word of God says. Don't be ashamed of the truth. Remember this. Remember that God's Word, God's Word is unchanging. And that should give us a great sense of confidence. It should give us a great sense of relief that we don't, have to, we don't have to figure it out. All we need to do is see what the Word of God says. And the Word of God is unchanging. It has not changed since it was given to us. Now, how it's written, and sometimes the, the translations that we have, are people are looking into it, trying to understand the words. And even how words have changed. That's why the King James language, sometimes it's a little difficult. Because of what was common English in the 1600s is not common English today. So we have to continually re-examine, but always come back to the solid truth of what God's Word says. It is unchanging. It is the same, just like God, yesterday, today, and forever. It will never change. The second thing is remember that God's truth will stand the test of time. Now, let me tell you, I, I have to re I've had to remind myself of that a lot in the last few years. I, I mean, I have. I've had to go, wait a minute. Listen, I know that this stance on what the Word of God says, I know that this stance is not going to be popular in the culture that we're living in today. This stance that you're taking is not going to be looked upon with, as, as a positive thing in the society that we're in. And then I have to stop and say, okay, but if this is the truth of God's word and I've delved into it and I've looked at it and I've asked the question, what does the Holy Spirit mean when he, when he inspired this to be written? Do I understand what the Holy Spirit meant when he inspired this to be written? And if I do, then I have no choice but to stand on that truth because it's the only thing that's going to stand the test of time. I'm telling you, all the lies and all the deceit and all the linguistic theft in the world is not going to overcome or overpower the Word of God. It will stand the test of time. You can trust it. Oh, man, how I pray for our young people today. How I pray that they would get the Word of God firmly implanted in their hearts. Man, one of the reasons I love the Iwana program because the Iwana program is all about planting the Word of God into the hearts of children. How I love our Sunday school program for our children, our young adults, and our, our teens because it is in those classes that are going to be taught the real living Word of God, the thing upon which they can stand, the thing they know will be unchanging, the thing they know will stand the test of time. That's why it's important. That's, in, that's why it's important that we, and, and I look around and many of us, you know, in, the, in this auditorium this morning have gray hair. And some have gray, have gray hair underneath whatever the color is we have on it, right? But that's okay. That's okay. We know we have a responsibility. And one of the greatest responsibilities that we have is to pass on the unchanging truth of God's Word to the next generation. That's our responsibility. 1 Corinthians, if you will, look at that. 1 Corinthians 11, 12 through 15. This is the Apostle Paul making his stand. And I hope we can stand with him. Listen to what he says. And what I am doing, I will continue to do. <laughs> uh, 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry. Thank you for correcting that. Sometimes... Computers mess me up. <laughs> Listen carefully. And what I am doing, I will continue to do. Why could Paul say that what I'm doing, I'm going to continue to do? He could say that because he, what he was doing is based upon the living word of God. 
And he knows that the word of God will never change. And he knows that it will stand the test of time. And what I am doing, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claims of those who would <clears throat> like to claim that in, uh, that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. What he's saying is this. I'm going to continue to do what I do because what I'm doing by the truth will undermine those who are claiming to do the same thing. But what they mean by that is totally different. You get what he's saying? He said, I'm going to continue to do what I'm doing. I'm going to continue to stand on the truth because ultimately it is the truth that will reveal the lie of those who are bringing that false belief system to you. That's what we do. We stand on the truth. Verse 13, for such men are false prophets, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if the servants, if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, their end will correspond to their deeds. Could I just encourage you this morning? Be a student of God's word. You know, listen to what your pastor says. I believe, you know, I, I, try, to be, I try to stay true and, uh, to the word of God always in my preaching. But listen to what the pastor says. Listen to what the radio uh, personality may be saying. You know, look at, the, look at the blog that I talked about. Look at those things, but, but think about it for yourself. Open the word of God and investigate. See if what is being said lines up with the truth of what God's word says. And set your course based upon what the Bible tells you. Because if you set your path on the course that the Word of God gives you, you will not have to change course. <laughs> it doesn't matter what the world does. It doesn't matter how terms change. It doesn't matter how the society redefines things. If you're standing and walking in the light in the, on the Word of God, you will never have to change course because the Word of God is forever. The Word of God is unchanging and the word of God will stand the test of time. Let me ask you a couple of questions as we close this morning. Where are your thoughts grounded? Where do you, where do you how do you ground your thoughts today? Are they grounded in, in the, the, the YouTube videos that you're watching? Are they grounded in the, the blogs that you're listening to? Are they grounded in the books that you're reading? Or are your thoughts grounded and rooted in the living Word of God? The unchanging Word of God that will stand the test of time. Where are your thoughts rooted? And let me ask you, are you being deceived by the cunning and the deception of the evil one? Well, I don't think I am. I'm a Christian. I love God. I'm, yes, you do. But listen, if we're not looking, if we're not examining, if we're not comparing what we're seeing and what we're hearing to the living word of God, then we're open to deception. We're open to the cunning of the enemy. Are you remaining true to God's unchanging word and truth? If you ever hear your say saying, I, I know the word of God says, but you're in trouble. I know the word of God says, but... No, you're in trouble. Remain true to the living word of God. And it does not change. And he will see you through. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love this morning. We thank you for your goodness and grace. Lord, we thank you that in, the, in a world of confusion, in a world of confusion that the enemy has uh, sought to distract us from the truth or to turn us from the truth. Lord, help us. Help us to not only engage ourselves, but also to reach out to and help and train those that are coming along behind the next generation. And Lord, might I say this morning, ask Lord, that in the world in which we live, we live today, we know that as followers of Jesus and as those who believe in the word of God, that it's unchanging and that it's true. Lord, we will more than likely find ourselves in the path of opposition, slander, uh, words, things that, that are going to seek to tear us down. And Lord, let us keep the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. 
guarding our minds and our hearts. Let us stand, not with anger and hatred or violence, but just stand in the love and the righteousness of Christ and the truth that you've given us. Knowing, Lord, that your word will stand the test of time when all else fails. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me? So we go into this time of invitation this morning. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, if you've never said yes to him, then I would plead with you this morning. Don't walk out of this church today. Don't walk out of this church today not knowing who Jesus is, who the Bible says that he is placing your faith and your trust in him and having a relationship with God the Father through his son, Jesus. If you've never done that, I would love to pray with you this morning. If you're a Christian already, you find yourself being swayed and tossed about in the, in the world that we're living in today, just get back to the word of God. Just saturate your mind and your heart with the truth of God's word. The altar is going to be open if anyone just wants to come and pray. Any, any decision that you have or if you would like me to pray with you, I'll be here. But as we worship together, this is your time to respond to what God is saying. Have thine own way. moment. A couple of things I want to mention before we dismiss today. Uh, first of all, just a reminder, as we usually do, that we don't pass the offering plate uh, in the service. And if you would like to make an offering, then you can do so by dropping your offering in the boxes at the back of each row of chairs. Um, also, in your, in your bulletin, there is a, a connection card. And we would ask that everybody, if we'd take just a moment uh, to fill that out, it would just be helpful. And if you're, you know, if you're here every Sunday, and if you just want to put your name on there and then prayer requests, just let us know that you're present. That's good. But if you're visiting with us today, uh, or if you've just recently been coming regularly, we would really love to have you fill the, out the information so that we can know that you're here and uh, maybe even send you some information about the church occasionally, okay? So thank you for doing that. Thank you for being present today and uh, just uh, keep the church in your prayers and keep uh, one another in prayer. This is a difficult generation, difficult time that we're living in. And uh, let's just uh, let's lift one another up in prayer. So let's all stand together as we dismiss this morning. Brother John, I love that song you sang today. Yeah, and the words that you shared with it too. Would you lead us in a closing prayer? Yeah. Father God, we thank you so much for your blessing that you bless us every day. All the time. We don't deserve what you bless us with. We thank you so much for the bottom of our Thank you now for words that we heard. Burn them into our heart, Father. We'll stand true. That is so important. Thank you, Father, for blessing.